So there's going to be a lot that happens quickly in this lecture, in part because, especially the first few parts of it, you've 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 seen this before. This these slides, a lot of these slides were presented in history theory too. At the beginning of that course, you may or may not recall, we talked about colonialism. Uh, we talked about the Spanish, the Spanish and Portuguese, and then we talked about the Dutch and the English, and they had two very different uh, deployments of architecture. So it's very specifically about how does architecture make possible the success of extractive capitalism? It turns out that design and architecture was at the core of how extractive capitalism was so damn successful in every period. And so we're gonna go back through this material to answer the question, the implied uh, question, uh, is larger than the questions that you've contributed here. Um, well, maybe this one, should the market drive our progress? Uh, a variation of that is how has the market driven architecture in the service of human progress? Human, we're being very generous here, let's face it. The wealthy power elite of Europe is the, in, in the early periods of this story uh, are the ones who are benefiting. So the, another way of saying this question that we're about to address is what role did architecture play in the tremendous success of extractive capitalism? And by the way, the implied question here as we go back in history how did we let this happen to the planet? How did this happen? And why is that important? If it's, if it's inevitable, if it's natural for this to happen, then we don't really care. It's just depressing, right? But I want to uh, encourage you that by figuring out how we got here and how architecture played a central role in putting us on this planet at this moment of crisis. Within that understanding lies the seeds of a solution that you can pursue during your careers. I might be right, I might be wrong. You will let me know in 10 or 40 years. Uh, send me a, a telepathy message uh, in 40 years and you let me know how it's going. Did this understanding of history hold the seeds for making a new path? Okay, questions before we jump in here? So here's the outline. The first the starting point is the right to the city. This is a principle that has become the focal point of a lot of what we do. And uh, at the heart of it uh, is this idea of how systems operate, uh, especially when it comes to the forces of capitalism. A lot of people will try to convince us that capitalism is natural, that forces, economic forces operate in the background naturally, and it's inevitable. There's an inevitability to these outcomes because market forces. But uh, <laughs> one of the challenges of engaging this topic is to distinguish between the things that are universal are uh, phenomena that would, you could erase it and it would reemerge. And other things that are optional, that are design constructs, that have been designed, have been reproduced, 
have expanded, have taken over, and are part of the structure. Remember we talked about structure and agency? We have agency, we can make decisions. We can leave the room or not leave the room. That's our agency. But we can't leave the room through this wall because the structure has limited our agency. So we make personal choices as limited by larger structures. Literally, where's the door in this case? So some of these structures that we find ourselves practicing architecture within are constructed and are optional and are designed and can be redesigned to produce better outcomes. Okay? And so this is an example of a nice man. The whole trial of the Nuremberg uh, war crimes trial, it, this was the defense of how, what a nice, what a good father, what a good community member uh, I can was. Uh, a pleasant man, polite, well-dressed, well-behaved, um, never an angry word, very nice guy. And he was simply following the orders. He was operating within the structure that he found himself in uh, as he uh, designed structures uh, and mechanisms, uh, logistics systems that funnel the maximum number of humans to their deaths in, in the gas chambers. And so it's this juxtaposition that Hannah Arendt, very, very a brilliant mind, who really transformed the way she really opened up our insights into how these things work, the relationship between structure and agency. And that the real danger is uh, that people who know better decide not to act. It's not that bad people are perpetrating evil, like in a James Bond movie, the evil genius who was uh, abused as a child and wants to get revenge on the rest of the world. And, you know, that's, that's cute. That's very cartoonish, but that's not how it works. Evil in our word in our world operates through these structural systems that absolve us of responsibility. We simply are doing our jobs. We simply are doing what is expected of us. We are simply uh, performing the tasks that if we weren't doing it, someone else would do. And that is what uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, her, her punchline, her takeaway was, it's not so much these violent acts of, uh, of taking people's lives, it's the banality of people. It's the going along with the structures. And so it's very important to understand which of these structural components are optional, are the product of design, and thus can be changed. And Another very optimistic thing that is in connection with this is that design thinking, the, the thing that architects have been doing and the thing that architecture schools have been training for hundred over a hundred years, those design skills have now been codified by Dan Brown in his book on design thinking, and it's become very, very popular. So popular that business schools have decided that they're gonna be use design thinking to make decisions in the 21st century. So much so that the Stanford Business School has rebranded itself in, uh, 15 years, 20 years ago. They went from being the B school, the business school, they now branded themselves the D school, the design thinking school. And so they use design studios as instead of the classrooms. The design studios are the place where the business majors, they're still getting masters of business administration, MBAs, but they're getting it in the studio and they're, they're solving problems through design thinking. And the, as I've emphasized previously, that the first step of design thinking is empathy that by having empathy for all users, 
even when we can't possibly know what it's like to be someone in a wheelchair because we're not in a wheelchair. We can't possibly know what it's like to be trans because we're not trans, most of us. Um, but we're obligated to do our best and then ask the actual users to empower and give their voices, allow their voices to be heard. That's the number one thing we do in design thinking. And so it's much more difficult. I love this photo, the dog owner empathizing with his dog. Isn't that sweet? Um, it's the secret to, it's the secret to our success. It's the secret to being able to achieve different outcomes than everything that's come before. It's one of the ways we make sure that we're not simply reproducing these systems that have caused so much damage and suffering in the world. We can do better. How can we do better? Empathy as step one, empathy for users. And that translates into the way we do these analysis assignments. We don't just talk about, uh, we don't stop with uh, the housing on the upper floors has balconies uh, on every unit, period, right? We say what the impact is. We say by putting balconies and large windows in the upper floors of housing, it brings uh, eyes on the street and a much safer urban realm. So every sentence, every statement, at every point in the analysis paragraph, the, the punchline is, is exudes empathy for users. How does it help the users? You don't just describe the architecture. Oh, Bjark Ingels is so cool. He has a, a ski slope on the roof. That's so cool. No, we don't care about the ski slope on the roof except how it improves the life of someone uh, that we're empathizing with. Does that make sense? That's why the analysis assignment is the way it is. It's, it's uh, suffused with the values that are emerging from this way of looking at architecture, the exercise itself. What do cities do in relation to the operations and reproduction of the systems of international capitalism? And how do they do that in a way that improves people's lives? Uh, the key concept is the right to the city. That it's not just uh, for the ultra wealthy. It's not just for white males. It's for everybody. It's not just for uh, people without disabilities. It's for everybody. And so uh, this is uh, this is the concept, the right to the city, that brings together this idea of climate change and social justice, because the impacts of climate change have already started altering people's lives. We talked about this one when we were talking about the refugee crisis and refugee camps. That the Syrian war is a climate change war that because of the drought, it caused uh, desperation and a civil uprising. The Syrian war is a result of climate change. And we're seeing that more and more. Resource warfare with oil is gonna give way soon, or it has already started giving way to resource warfare over water and lithium for electric cars. So these are the interplay between market forces and um, big, uh, big effects in our world. Okay. So in order to get at this, I often, a lot of lecturers get into definitions of their terms, and I like to leave that to you guys. We learn what things mean according to what things do. But in this case, I have to define, because when you hear people use the term capitalism, they might mean one thing or they might mean the other thing. The two things that we mean by capitalism is capitalism with a small c. And it's what you studied in your economics course. How many people are or took an economics course? <clears throat> so what's capitalism? I guess it's right here. 
What are the four ingredients of capitalism? This is right. You learned this, right? Are you taking it right now? But sometime in the first week, they said the four ingredients of capitalism are land, ooh, architecture. We dig that. Labor. Well, oh, housing. Labor is housing. So these two architecture. Capital, which is you know the factories, that's kind of architectural. And profit. Well, profit didn't used to be architectural, but look at that graph. People are, who are gathering that profit and becoming wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, they need to diversify their investments. Who's got $10 million? Okay. I recommend that you take at least a third of that $10 million and invest in real estate. The rest can go into stocks and you can, woohoo, and stocks will perform, outperform everything else uh, historically, mostly. Um, future performance, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future outcomes. I have to say that. But generally, Oh, wow, what a party it's been to be invested in the stock market. But just in case, take one third of it, put it into real estate. Uh, shell companies are what own the, the units at the top floor of Dalton, one Dalton place. And we're going to read about this in the icebergs on the culture thing. So, profit. So, all of these have architectural components, and there's an interplay between this and architecture. So the small C capitalism has to do with these four components. These operate in capitalism. Uh, also, it's about supply and demand. Is that thing about supply and demand? Right? Even if you haven't taken the economics course, supply and demand. You could get rid of our concept of supply and demand and move everyone into a cave, start over from scratch, or onto a desert island. <laughs> And there would be coconuts, and there would be seaweed, and there would be fish. And the loss of supply and demand that you just erased would come back. So the loss of supply and demand are one of those universals that are a part of all market forces. And that turns out uh, one of the reasons state socialism in the Soviet Union and China failed so dramatically and miserably with uh, tens of millions of people starving to death is because friends don't let friends deny the operation of market forces of supply and demand, right? 40 million people in China, 30 million people in the Soviet Union when they tried to control the cost of wheat and rice. So um, that's the small C capitalists. But then there's big C capitalism. Big C capitalism is what you hear about in the news when people talk about, ooh, capitalism uh, in our current state. We have constructed these forces that have more to do with monopoly, as in your phone. How much do you pay for your phone? This phone subscription. Who pays $10 or less per month? All right, who pays 10 to $40 in your phone subscription? Who pays more than $40? Okay, who's from overseas? Well, who's been overseas? Who knows about how much things cost overseas? How much do phone, how much do people pay for a phone service per month in the Republic? It's crazy. Four people, four people have phones. How much? $8, Eight dollars, ten dollars a month. And you pay as you go, right? You put pulse uh, onto your phone. Oh no, it's a, like you yeah. might order things for a salary that you can get to that, or you can just like go to a store, ask them to recharge. Charge. Yeah. You can like put in like a dollar and fifty cents. Like, right. You can also uh so get this, Africa is poor. Sub-Saharan Africa is poor, right? They don't have phones. They don't have smartphones, do they? They do. They have smartphones. Not only that, they use their phones for financial transactions way beyond what we do. 
they're sending uh, points to each other in text messages all the time. And that's how they buy things. They're using their phone for transactions way beyond what we do, believe it or not. And it doesn't cost them $40 a month for their phone subscription. Why is that? Market forces, they have competition. They have small C capitalism is still operating. There are so many phone service providers that they're competing with each other and they're keeping the cost of phone service down. Why can't we have it? Because we have not a monopoly. We don't have one company controlling all phone services, but we have few enough companies. We have Verizon, ATT, T-Mobile. Well, T-Mobile owns Sprint, so it's a waste. Yeah, T-Mobile owns Sprint. So we have a handful of phone companies. They don't even, they do play golf on the weekends with each other, but they don't have to. They just wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> hey, we over here at Verizon, we think people should be paying $45 a month, not 40 Their phone service. Who's with me? I don't even have to ask. I know you're with me. We're just to raise our rates and come and to raise your rates. Wink, wink, nod, nod. That's capital C capitalism. It operates uh, in a very specific way beyond what you would expect from market forces. And so it's two very different things. So when we see books on the newsstand like this, Reimagining Capitalism, this is an author who understands that capital C capitalism, trademark, the specific kind of monopoly uh, operation where you try to capture market share and absorb all the competition, like Disney and Pixar, you, know, it's ha- you name an industry that's happening. Um, that's one version of capitalism, but it's an option. You don't have to do that. That's what authors like this are doing. Then you have Naomi Klein, who's a hero. Right? She has opened our eyes to so many different things, but she says it's capitalism versus the climate. When she says capitalism versus the climate, that C is a capital C only in this very specific monopoly capitalism system is it, in, is it antagonistic to the survival of the planet. Any economist, like your, the professor who teaches your economics class, he, uh, he or she would say, ah, capitalism uh, is a system for finding the right balance between things. It's not antagonistic to the survival of the planet. It is the key to the survival of the planet. It's only when you dismantle the market forces of small C capitalism and replace it with these distortions on markets with capital C capitalism that you run into this problem, right? What we do in markets is We identify what the externalities are and we price those things. If small C capitalism were operating in a healthy way, the economic forces would say, hey, hey everybody, you know how it's been free to dump stuff into the air and dump stuff into the ocean and dump stuff in the landfill? You know how it's been more or less free to do all that? Well, turns out that is an externality that is causing what we call market failures. The planet is dying. That's a market failure. Let's internalize. Let's put a cost on landfill. Did that years and years ago. Let's put a cost on dumping things in the ocean. Sounds like a good idea. Let's put a price. Let's charge a price for how much carbon you put into the atmosphere. That would make it subject to market forces. And all of a sudden, the markets would respond by finding cheaper ways to dispose of things or to produce things so that it does not create carbon. And all of a sudden, you've now turned around the, the, the ship and the planet is now healing itself. But capital C capitalism keeps intervening to prevent those externalities from being priced. We cannot put a price on carbon because the, uh, the monopoly interests won't allow it. 
And so it's not, I, I think Naomi Klein, as wonderful as she is, is, is dangerously incorrect here. It's not capitalism, small C capitalism versus the climate. It's big C capitalism versus the climate. All you have to do is reimagine the way capitalism works. And all of a sudden you, you've unified everyone towards a common shared beneficial goal. Same is true for housing, which is housing in cities, which is what we're here to talk about. But it, it's, it's a bigger issue as well. Let's see what Naomi Klein says here. The majority of the human race does not see global warming as a serious threat. Celebrate! Climate legislation is dead. We, in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. On the other side, those people who are the most affected by climate change, most affected by environmental injustice, have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. I spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carbon in the air and the economic system that put it there. That old paradigm will be forced into change, either by the environment around us or by us. Communities were thrown into the front line. See the incredible transformation of that world. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question What if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance we're ever going to get to build a better world? Change or be changed? There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent a different future. So it brings us back to what we do in the design studio is uh, we can enter here and say we need to change the culture. What's the architecture project that would have an impact there? We can enter here. We can say our systems are the problem. What's the design project that can change the system? Or we can enter here and design a cool building and uncover opportunities in that process to have an impact on the system and or the culture and it becomes very direct. Or if you're a DJ, you can just enter here and you can take your, your mad disc spinning act on the road and you can just do it here and not do architecture. But it's an intertwined system. We used to think there were arrows on these that the uh, system will tell the architect what to do. But increasingly, we are finding out in the way some architects are behaving in some of the design projects that we hope you identify for us and show us in your analysis that are starting with design projects and they are, the impacts are moving up this chain and having impacts on systems and, and cultures. That's what we're looking for. And we're back to that example. Uh, yes, it's possible to design a slightly better slave ship, but can we do better than that? So um, let's take a quick, Re revisitation of Spanish and Portuguese colonialism when these tiny little 
Catholic tribes in this far off land way from the center of civilization that was Islam, the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean. Uh, all of a sudden, these tiny little tribes of Portugal and Spain mastered uh, navigation and they went out across the world. And the Pope said, okay, you two tribes of, of Catholicism, we have to divide the planet uh, in two. Uh, Portugal, you take everything on this side of the line and Spain, you take everything on that side of the line, okay? Just to keep the peace. And then, uh, then someone said, wait a minute, but the world is round, it's not flat, it's round. And so they said, okay, let's continue that line over here. And um, Spain, you get up to here, and Portugal, you get up to here, where I came from. It got a little complex here because they weren't very good. So Portugal, so a lot of Portuguese is in Timor, Macau, Nagasaki. This was all Portuguese. And then Spanish um, in the Philippines. So the line was pretty jagged because their navigation wasn't very good. But this was all Spanish. That's why we speak Spanish in this part of Latin America. And we speak Portuguese in uh, Brazil and I think Suriname. Or is that Dutch? Dutch. Where else do we speak Portuguese? Angola. Angola, that's right. Prepared. Yeah, lots of Portuguese all through the Indian Ocean. Yeah. So um, Columbus, Mexico. And this is another example of the project system culture. When the Spaniards uh, encountered the largest city in the world, Tenochtitlan, which is now called Mexico City, they, they found this cool thing. It's called a grid, a gridded city. So Tenochtitlan was a canal gridded city that, um, <clears throat> that was the largest city in the world. The Spaniards had never seen anything like it. And so um, what they have to do is they have to conquer it and they have to use the projects to alter the system and the culture. They have to demonstrate cultural superiority by burying, by dismantling the symbols, the architectures of religion of the Mexica uh, people and take those building materials and construct a grand cathedral on the ruins of what's left that they didn't dismantle. So that's what we looked at in this, this first lecture was where all the cities of, uh, Latin America, where this grand complex of the Aztec religion were dismantled and the building materials used to construct a Catholic city with the grid intact because the Spaniards were not stupid. They said, hey, this grid idea is pretty good. And then they made it into the laws of the Indies. And the laws of the Indies was a architectural design that was encoded in legal language. And it was sent to every town and city throughout Latin America. It was not just an architecture, it was a system and it was a culture. And so uh, you go throughout Latin America, you see the church, uh, the town square and the housing districts and that reinforced uh, the system it wasn't Technically, it was not slavery. Uh, the Pope and Queen Isabella said, no, 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 no. If you convert them to Christianity, you can't enslave them. You, you have to respect their souls. So they came up with this encomienda system, which achieved the same thing. It's more or less the same oppressive conditions, <clears throat> um, punishable by death if you stepped out of line but it's not slavery. So it's okay with the Pope and it's okay with Queen Isabella. Very similar to what happened at the end of slavery in the United States, when we went from slavery, we had 10 years, uh, or 12 years of reconstruction, but then uh, in the compromise of 1877, 
we have uh, the federal troops left the southern states and the Jim Crow South came in and instead of every former enslaved inhabitant having 40 acres to farm, they, that land was taken back and they were forced to work that land uh, in something called, what was it called? Sharecrop, thank you, Phil. <clears throat> so here's a dramatic example of the Aztec temple, uh, slave encomienda labor used to bury that temple in this cute little cathedral built on the top. The mountain of silver that was mined, extracted, sent overseas to Spain, uh, which then made its way to China uh, in causing a collapse of the silver markets globally. So globalization didn't just start when your parents were uh, in high school in Conmienda. And the system of race is overlaid on this. When is a painting more than just a painting? than a, a piece of art and decoration. This is a painting uh, that was a very common type of painting that you find in the noble houses throughout Latin America. Uh, and it's a catalog of status where the painter is very carefully depicting the color of the skin of each character in this painting. This is basically a catalog of hierarchy depending on the racial content of the blood of each person. And they could make a lot of money by uh, being bribed to depict people as being whiter than they were or to falsify the uh, ancestry records in order to, uh, to raise their status because this was how the system operated. So then we moved from the Spanish and Portuguese, which was very much a royal investment system. And now we get into really the explosion of uh, uh, capitalism uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the mechanism of the multinational corporation. The first multinational corporation was invented in London in 1601. The next year, uh, Amsterdam followed suit. And Amsterdam, because uh, in the Netherlands and Holland at the time, in Holland, they had a, everybody was a speculator. Everyone bought and sold commodities and they played the market with spices, with lumber. And this tiny little fishing village where there was a dam across the Amstel River uh, became a very popular fishing market and then became Amsterdam. And on that dam, uh, they started trading fish. And then since people need more than fish, they traded corn, wheat, barley, uh, flowers, uh, you name it, this was the marketplace. And there were so many people traveling here to purchase uh, and sell things that this became literally the first open market. And the way the open market worked was it was literally an open market. If you wanted to buy fish, you come to this column. If you want to sell fish or buy fish, everyone buying and selling fish, you come to this location. And I show you the fish and you say, well, that fish looks great, but what about the fit all the fish that I'm purchasing? Well, right over here, here's my boatload of fish. So the key operation of this market was first and foremost, all the buyers and sellers of one particular commodity are in one place. So if the supply goes up, the price can go down. If the demand goes up, the price can go up. When you put lots of buyers and sellers together, that is how open markets operate. This is the architectural mechanism by which open markets were codified in European societies and then globally. This is still what happens. And uh, I trust you um, uh, that your fish is fresh because I know that if I wanted to, I could walk around the corner and check out a whole boatload of fish. So I don't need to check the boatload of fish because I can check the boatload of fish. I know that you're trustworthy and I don't need to. See how that works? And that, that level of trust became the basis 
for paper certificates and money. There's the boat and stock certificates. So all of a sudden you had mobile uh, documents that instead of taking delivery of the fish here in Amsterdam, I could travel to uh, London and take delivery. I, I would have a certificate, a piece of paper that says I'm guaranteed uh, the delivery of fish there. And so all of a sudden transactions became much easier and it became more mobile. And these, uh, you recognize the architecture of the open market. This became the architecture of exchange <coughs> buildings. <clears throat> this is the one in Amsterdam. And the warehouse below the exchange building were there, not because people actually checked the quality of the goods, but they could check the quality of the goods. So trust, this is the architecture of trust. Uh, and if you're concerned about whether or not scale is showing the right weight, well, here's the box, which is the, uh, the standards of weights and measures. And so the officer of the box would walk over to the market here and check the scales to make sure that they were accurate. And even when he wasn't doing that, you know you could. So here's the architecture. There's the box, the, the Office of Weights and Measures. Here's that corn market, that first one I showed you where uh, you can just step over the side and check the quality of the fish. And here's the exchange, the, the stock exchange that developed after that. And then here's the merchant's bank, which was part of the town hall. So you have the town hall guaranteeing the exchange uh, value. I bring in my paper and you give me silver or gold. Um, and so this is, the, this is the mechanisms of global capitalism architecturalized in the, in the design of the open market here, the extension of that open market here, the guarantee of weights and measures, the, uh, the monetary part of that, and the fact that it's close. All of these things are very close together. This, this spatial arrangement at the core of Amsterdam is how capitalism came into the world. It's through this architecture of each building and the relationship between them around the dam on the Amstel River. And the houses of Amsterdam all were like this. We lived, the, the family lives in this part of the house. Down here is the storeroom, here is the shop. Uh, and you can take stuff in and out of the canal or on the street. And this is the storage place where I put all the cloves or the nutmeg or the pepper. And when the price of pepper goes up, I quickly move the pepper out to this hoist way. I take it down either to the canal or to the street, and I quickly bring it to that marketplace and I sell the pepper for a high price. So the, the, the population of Amsterdam was filled with families who would, uh, their wealth would grow or shrink depending on how shrewd they were at trading the commodities. This is the architecture of Amsterdam. You'll go. And Amsterdam exploded in the years uh, around 1650 uh, because of the trade that was happening with Asia. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, the same house type was developed on the Asian end of the trade market. This is a Chinese shop house that you would see in Malaysia or Singapore or uh, Indonesia, and this was the same thing. The family would occupy some part of it, but the rest was a factory and a shop. And so uh, these things were parallel on both sides of this level of trade. Um, and this is the city of Batavia, now it's called Jakarta, which uh, developed across uh, a rectilinear version of the canal city model. And again, it wasn't speculators, but this is uh, European officers 
had to have a nice place to live. So they built this beautiful quarter for the European population. Uh, and then on this, so this is the beautiful part of the European population. And then a river that acts like a moat. And then these are all the, the indentured uh, labor that uh, kept the port going. And so you have a directory of the names of each person of European heritage or Chinese heritage. Then you had a dress code for the non-European residents that helped them enforce uh, the laws that prevent people from moving freely across these bridges. So in each one of these bridges, there'd be uh, checkpoints and every one of these places became guarded checkpoints based on what people are wearing you could control who moved at one time of day. So you could control the population. And that, um, that continued, so here's one of the checkpoints. And these paintings were also catalogs of who was who, who's important, who has power, who are the servants, who are the slaves. Um, so you, you can identify the characters in the foreground by what they're wearing and their skin tone. And so this catalog was a diagram of movement through the city. And these paintings were produced in Amsterdam and in Batavia. And again, you can identify every character in this painting and in this painting according to who they are in the society based on their clothing and their skin tone. And so these paintings were catalogs of social status. And the cities were organized to control who had the right to move in and out of the city. And when things went, uh, oh, here's, uh, even into the 20th century, you see Dutch maps that depict every building for the European community depicted this way. And then the green looks like gardens, like maybe nobody lives here. But it turns out that the green is where the most people live. It's just not acknowledged in the maps. It's, it's an area of town that is still uh, gated and controlled and dominated by non-European at this point, non-European population. So it, even into the 20th century, this was still operating under Dutch colonial rule as a way of controlling population. And so this is how architecture operates as part of the system of colonialism and extractive capitalism. This is um, what happens when the Dutch colonial officers panicked and were afraid of rebellion. So jumping forward in history, we had this as well, the Great Fire of London resulted in an opportunity to start over from scratch. And so uh, they had a competition. Architects said, we should try this. Again, you recognize all these axial things, the visual corridors of the city, beautiful movement. Um, so that was a big thing. These squares. Um, it turns out that the infrastructure was very difficult to change. So they didn't do any of those. Uh, they pretty much left it the same. And the squares of the famous squares of London emerged out of the conversion of the wealthiest states into residential neighborhoods, at the center of each of which is a park. Um, this is uh, one of the famous examples of data visualization. Have you heard of Edward Tufte? Edward Tufte in the 90s uh, was the uh, father of information design. Information design is what we have, it's what architects do, we've always done. Again, this is something architects have been doing forever, but uh, when the rest of the world discovers it, they coin a new term, they call it information design. It's, uh, and it's defined and it actually helps us see more clearly what it is we have always done. Information design is where the manner in which the information is communicated is as or more important than the information itself. That the message is much clearer because of the way it's communicated. So all of this data is available in spreadsheets. 
But if you stare at a spread, you can stare at the spreadsheet as long as you want. It, it won't help you. It just it's just a spreadsheet of numbers. But when you draw it, when you draw it so that the width of the line represents how much coal is moving from uh, Great Britain to other parts of the world, then you start to get a sense of what's going on here. This is the movement of coal. And this is a very famous depiction uh, because the way it's drawn is, is so fundamental to an understanding of, of what's happening here. You could never get it from a spreadsheet. So the factory system uh, was very much related to colonialism. The, the raw materials are brought to Europe and uh, because of water power, how much does water weigh per cubic foot again? Sixty-two. So sixty-two pounds per cubic foot of water. If you live, if you're in New England or in uh, England, uh, and there's a river near your town, and the river drops more than a few feet, then you just become wealthy because of. If every cubic foot of water weighs 62 pounds and it's dropping 10 feet, that's 620 foot pounds, right? You took physics, right? That's a torque. That's 620 foot pounds per cubic foot, feet of water. Do you have a big river near your town? The Merrimack? Uh, wow you've just become very wealthy because you can capture that water dropping, that volume of water and you can make a factory. And so that's what happened throughout England and uh, North America. And uh, you have the industrial revolution. That was converted then to steam power, thus the, all the coal and the living conditions uh, because of the burning of all the coal uh, became very dire. And so we're seeing a bunch of examples of how to draw to uh, make sense of phenomena. This is a drawing uh, published in newspaper to show how the need for quality worker housing near the factories, the, the scarcity of quality worker housing near the factories was causing the creation of what we now call historically underserved communities. And so you put the stories that went with this picture, the paragraph that went with the picture, when something like you clean your linens, you put them out to dry, and an hour later, you have to uh, shake out the coal dust that has settled on all your linens because the air is so loaded with coal smoke. Uh, from the locomotive passing, from the viaducts, from the factories, from the chimneys all over London, Mary Poppins. And so you can do a similar thing with uh, the industrial towns of uh, New England. Here is the booth map that came a few decades after. Who, who read the Frederick Engels uh, working conditions? So this is a famous piece of writing that architects have been reading for decades that talks about how, uh, it talks about, it's basically the, the text that goes with this drawing that came later, that the wealthy uh, elite would travel down these main thoroughfares and all they would see are these shops with uh, glittering uh, bright products, shiny, looked, everything looked wonderful, but it was behind those shops, uh, hidden from view are these neighborhoods where the housing uh, was so tightly packed without proper sanitation that you have horrible uh, conditions uh, of the historically underserved communities. Uh, and so here you see more depictions of what that looks like uh, in map view when you're from a slightly elevated viewpoint with the architectural scale human activity in the foreground and the larger situation in the background. And this is Edward, have you seen this? This is Edward and Tufti. When people talk about Tufti, 
they often use this image. This shows uh, how Napoleon's uh, forces started out very, there are a lot of soldiers. Some would go off and, and uh, take over, you know, do battle over here. And, uh, and, but the forces are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they fail in Moscow and they come back and like 1% of the soldiers made it back. Now you might think, well, that's because it's war, people die in war. But then Tufti points out that here's the temperature at each point in the march. And uh, said on the way back, this, uh, this is October uh, 14th, 24th. And so the temperature just keeps dropping uh, between October and December as the troops are limping back from Moscow, more and more are dying uh, because of the, the cold. So this is something that is celebrated by Tufti, but it's what architects do. This is what our plans and our sections and maps and site plans are all very complex, re simultaneous representations of so many different operations, so many different systems. Your drawings that you're producing in Studio 6 right now are showing structural systems, mechanical systems, the envelope systems, the circulation patterns, the, the program, the windows, all of these things are brought together in these large drawings. That's what architects do. And uh, here's another one. Has anyone seen this one? Yes. 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 I love that story. Right. What is the story? Um, so so basically uh, the story if I remember was there is a contaminated uh, water pump in a specific area of the city that people were getting water and uh, people were getting sick by children were getting sick and dying. Um, but there's another part of town where um, people were going to this bar. And um, they weren't getting sick because they were just drinking alcohol and the alcohol was killing all of the bacteria. That was the yeah, that's why we have beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's basically the story. Is just that they didn't know what, why everybody was getting sick until this one guy traced the illness back to the contaminated. And he used he did it by drawing. He said. Let's make a black square whenever someone dies. So these are the black squares. And he saw um, the, more, the closer you get, you know, so where, where the black squares is, right here, there's the pump. You know, all of the government officials knew where cholera came from. Cholera came from bad smells. They knew it. It was the miasma theory of health. It's very similar to what we went through with COVID. Like we didn't know how it was transmitted. We had to figure it out. Um, but this process took 100 years. People would die of cholera and it was all about the stink. And, but it wasn't the air, it was the water. And Jon Snow, not the one from Game of Thrones, different Jon Snow. I wonder if... And he made this map. And based on, he showed it to the authorities and based on this, the authorities went right down <laughs> and took the pump handle off that pump. So no one could pump water and the death rate went down. And now we know we don't have cholera anymore in part because our water supply, one of the good things we did with all this growth is uh, we improved water supply and health through those things. And so we have all of these factory towns that well-meaning industrialists are saying, sure, I'm already rich. I don't need to be richer. I want to do something. I want to create better housing so that my workers are happy. I want to create a factory town with cultural institutions, education, and uh, civic pride, uh, and uh, a healthy society. So this was all about... Uh, doing more than just getting rich, making 
uh, widgets or whatever it is they made. I think they cast stoves here. So cast iron stoves. And doing it through the configuration, the improvement of the architecture and the configuration of the towns. And many of the towns uh, that you're familiar with uh, were part of that, including, what's the name of that town? Just north of Boston. Lowell. Did you learn about the history of Lowell? <laughs> it's your, what? It's your project? Yeah. Coincidence. I don't think so. So the young women of, of Lowell, right? You know about the young women of Lowell? Could you read about that? Oh, yeah. So history matters. So, um, so people have struggled to draw these conditions, and they're not architects. They, they do their best, but um, it's not very good. But the photography, Jacob Rees uh, published a book uh, around 1900 called How the Other Half Lives. And he brought cameras into the tenement apartments of the Lower East Side where people worked from home. They did everything on Zoom. Uh, from, no, but they, they did piecework. They, they made little decorative things hour after hour and they made a, a bushel basket full of little ornamental uh, textile items and they would sell them for three cents for a bushel and that's so that's why they're gathering next to the windows because that's where the light comes from so they work next to the windows and they sleep away from the windows and you guys know what hot desking is did you have a hot desk where we don't have enough studio desks for all the students like we're going to have next fall you know that there's like 200 freshmen coming yes yeah. where are we going to put them all outside are we going to hot desk them no so what is hot desking? Hot desking is you have your studio, you have your studio period and you're at your desk and then you get up and you leave and the next group of students comes in and the desk is still hot and you are working. That's hot desking. This is hot bedding. You could rent the bed by the hour. That's how difficult the housing crisis was. So we're gonna look at uh, uh, grids. There's that book. Um, we're going to look at grids as part of this system. So when I was when I was in architecture school, this was my apartment in New York. I lived in one of those. It was hard. I had to lie to get there. Was competition was fierce, even though people were dying uh, from the drug wars on my block. I still had to lie to get into this apartment. Just me and my girlfriend. Um, I mean, we paid like seven hundred and fifty dollars a month, which used to be a lot of money back then. The guy next to us was paying $47 a month because he had come over uh, during the Holocaust and uh, he, he spoke Yiddish and Spanish. He never learned English because the neighborhood went from a complete Yiddish neighborhood to a completely Puerto Rican. And so he never learned English. And he was still paying $47 a month and the landlord wanted him out and the landlord was terrorizing him and we were trying to help him. It was a mess just to raise the rents because landlord no the land I was helping him stay but the the ceiling fell in because of a water leak above and he stepped on a nail and he never recovered. It was very very sad. Anyway Radiant Garden City Beautiful as a housing <laughs> strategy. This is this was my term project when I took this course as an undergraduate. I put together these insurance maps of my neighborhood since the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, 
and this was the neighborhood uh, before 1900. And then in the 20th century, it was all bulldozed and Radiant Garden City Beautiful took its place. Um, but my apartment in Rockford. Anyway. Um, so we see very clearly the different approaches to Radiant Garden City Beautiful as it manifested in that part of um, New York City. Now, here's an example. Have you heard of Samuel Mockby and the Rural Studio in Alabama? Did you hear about it from Sam Maddox? Because Sam Maddox um, went through this program. Uh, it made an appearance in the last lecture of History Theory 2. Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. But Samuel Mockby was saying, uh, Architecture students come through these programs and they have these theoretical projects. Maybe it eventually is beneficial to people, maybe not. We'll never know. But these projects we know are beneficial because we work with the people who are benefiting. We build them houses. And there's something very convincing about them, their smiles and their appreciation that that type of design work is actually beneficial. But there was a crisis when Mockby died. So Mockby was hugely successful. Over the course of 20 years or so, they built maybe 40, 50, 60 houses. They improved things for all of those people. But after Mockby's death, people who uh, inherited the rural studio in Alabama said, all this really, all of this effort, all of this work, all of this time, and all we did was benefit 50 or 60 families. Look at the scale of the problem. Look at the scale of our income, which, by the way, is a million times greater than the scale of all the other architecture programs in the world put together. It's still only 50 or 60 houses. We, we can do better. We must do better. And so they went from project to project project, project, to projects that have an impact on the system. So they actually looked at how houses are financed in rural Alabama. They looked at the bank loan practices. How does uh, a poor family get a loan so that they can build a proper house? And how can we make changes to that loan program in conjunction with uh, making prototypes that can be cheaply and convincingly, uh, as in convincing the bank that this is going to work. So they, they developed new designs, a series of design prototypes that would qualify for bank finance and convince the banks to change their lending practices. And instead of doing one project at a time, they spent their design efforts focusing on prototypes and uh, building houses that they could be built for $20,000. And they started building not just one house at a time, but building dozens uh, and hundreds of houses. And that's when you shift from the project uh, impact to a system impact. And when you bring dignity to the impoverished communities of Alabama, you also uh, potentially are having an impact on the larger culture. <clears throat> Some of the, so that's one, so we're into the, I don't know if you've noticed this, we've made the transition from history of the past to now what's happening, what can, what then must we do uh, is, what we try to sneak in at the end of the lectures. Um, this is a very real thing that is happening in my town, in Boston, and uh, will be happening wherever you end up. Um, this is uh, called the missing middle housing, where uh, in the post-war period, we were very good 
at building lots and lots of single family houses. Thank you very much, architecture. Thank you very much, banking system. Thank you very much, zoning, single family zones. Thank you very much, towns and cities. You succeeded in building this type of housing. But what do you do when uh, the number, uh, the average size of a family goes down? The household, the average household size has gone from four or five in the post war period. What's the average size of a household? It's like one and a half. So what do we do when the world is filled with detached single family homes and the average household size is one and a half? What do you do? Yep, that's one thing you do. Um, but what are we doing? How are we addressing them? Building bigger We are building. How did you know what the answer I was looking for? I see it on boundary. Right. The average house size has gone from about 1,500 square feet 30 years ago to twice that, 3,000 square feet. So instead of shifting the way uh, to follow market forces, if the market demand is for household sizes that are increasingly small, uh, headed by single mothers in many cases, um, if household size is going smaller, how is it that uh, home size is getting is doubled? Again, it's the exchange value versus the use value. What we need are many, many, many more, more affordable, smaller units. What we're getting are larger and larger and more and more expensive homes. Why? Because of the market distortions in housing. That's why you're going to have trouble finding a place to live unless we can quickly move away from the split of high rise uh, public housing that we kind of stopped building uh, several decades ago and the sea of single family houses. We need to supply the missing middle, the triple deckers that are now illegal to build. Why is the triple decker illegal to build? Why can't we build triple deckers? They're ugly. If only that was the reason. We don't pass laws. Zoning laws make it difficult to build anything but single family dwellings. But even when we can build uh, multiple family dwellings, why can't we build a triple deck? Accessibility. Accessibility, we have exclusions for that. Uh, we can make that work. But the biggest, the number one reason uh, is parking. The parking requirements uh, make the typical lot too small to squeeze the parking we need to build the triple deck. So uh, there are a lot of systemic structural reasons why there's no, like this whole range of middle housing options of triple deckers and multiple family dwellings, we just can't build them. The other reason is it's difficult to build them. It's, it's difficult to build a building because of the permitting process. The neighbors are saying you can't build anything that I don't approve of. Um, and so it's very hard to build something. So builders can only afford to take a risk and, and try to build things that are going to make the most money possible. And so we find ourselves working for developers and for homeowners who are making the fanciest, biggest house they can possibly make. And so that's another reason why there's no middle, this whole middle segment of housing is missed. So we are changing the rules. We are changing the rules uh, to fill in that gap of the missing middle. We talked about uh, in the state of Massachusetts, the affordable housing supply law, which is the 40B law. And we're incentivizing these types of building types, uh, these building types uh, 
And these types of streetscapes where the bottom floor is an active use, is what we call it. So it's retail or daycare or something that brings life to the street. We're requiring street plantings. We're uh, making it safer for pedestrians. But it's not just the design of the streets. It's also the design of the housing that produces that street. So again, we're back to this idea that it's not just the street, it's not just the house, it's the interplay between the, the new, newly defined street walls in, in relationship to this complete street idea where it's not just for cars anymore. And we have uh, 40B and 40R rules in Massachusetts um, that tells us that um, 40B is every town needs to have at least 10% of their housing stock affordable to people earning 80% of the median. And towns that have met that uh, have met that supply threshold can go about their business uh, requiring certain things from every project. But in the towns that haven't met that, let's find that. In the towns that are green or the towns that are white, uh, it's only the towns that are in blue that have met that threshold. And every other town in the state uh, is subject to having a developer come in and say, uh, I noticed that you have not complied with the 10% threshold of the 40B law. And I noticed that you have the single family zoning uh, area here. Well, I invoke 40B, I'm going to produce um, multiple family housing, and I can, I can do it as of right wherever I want in your town. Incredibly large amount of that housing on Oh, yeah? yeah. What they're towns? They're cutting down forests. Harwich and Chatham and Garment specifically, they're cutting down forests and like hiding affordable housing complexes behind. Right. Bills and streets yeah. to try to bring that number up so that they don't have to be across Right. So towns are preemptively building their own affordable housing so that they can overcome that threshold and not be subject to the whims of these developers who are given the right to build whatever they want, wherever they want, which uh, towns are terrified of. Remember the town, the most the most terrifying sound uh, that a town can hear is the cry of a newborn baby. Why is that? Remember why? Schools. The most expensive thing for us to do as a town is to educate more children. If we could ban children from our town, we would. But we can't. So instead, what do we do? I think Caleb answered this last time. We go from quarter acre zoning to half acre zoning. We go from half acre zoning to two acre zoning. We go from two to five, from five to 10. We make the minimum lot size so large that the only thing you can do is to put a fancy big single family house. And even if a, a, a fertile couple moves in, it's only one instead of 16, right? You've reduced the density. Now with 40B, we're all vulnerable. We might have to educate lots and lots of babies. And it's still illegal to uh, ban children. It's still illegal to uh, discriminate against uh, fertile couples or families with children. So we try to do these other things the same way we did with redlining. So that's, and then, so that's where we get 40R. 40R is a smart growth version of 40B. It prioritizes those areas of town because we also have traffic. The most terrifying thing is educating the child. The second most terrifying thing is you know, generating more car trips in our congested, our cute little New England town. We hate educating children, except our children, and we hate generating car trips except our car trips. 
right? So that's how local town governments operate in language. So 40R is a smart growth thing that says, let's put this higher density housing close to Main Street. If there's a train station, we put it near the train station. If there's bus surface down Mass Ave or some other post road, we put the, the housing where the transportation service is. We get trans, transit oriented development. That's what 40R is. But uh, in towns like Cambridge, where we've, we've surpassed our 10% threshold, still our biggest problem, according to city councilors, is housing affordability in the city of Cambridge. Uh, voters were saying it was much more serious than COVID, the, this housing affordability crisis in Cambridge. And so this house that I advised the owner to tear down because it's unsavable, they saved it and they built 100% affordable housing out of it. And it's a beautiful um, award-winning project. Um, we're changing towns all over are saying no more single family zone. We're changing our single family zone to allow accessory dwelling units, ADU, which means we used to call them uh, in-law apartments over the garage where the in-law, the mother-in-law can live. Um, but renters, Airbnb, you can you go from one family to two families and you split houses into exactly as Caitlin was saying. Uh, you house more families in the same form that used to be a single family. Now you make it a multiple family. That is no longer illegal. Uh, and then in my in the parcel next to my house, uh, you allow the developer to do anything they want. They can build a 500 foot tall building right there next to my house. 